Welcome, BBCers, to episode number 113 of the Broken by Concept podcast, the number one solo queue podcast for your entertainment. That's the only one I added in there, Curtis, for your entertainment. Excellent. All right, so people know us. We love taking things from other fields, other crafts, other professions, and tr- applying it to League of Legends. Right, that's what we do a lot in this podcast with our clients and mastery. Champ mastery is a really, really big one. Huge. So we came across this uh, this master musician. Um, someone linked this to you, I believe. Yeah. So someone in the MLA linked me this video, and his name's Kenny Werner. I don't really know too much about him. All we know is that he wrote a book called Effortless Mastery. And uh, he's a jazz musician, I believe. And he's known for his improvisational skills and entering the flow state, essentially. Something he calls the space. And <clears throat> I end up watching this, this video. I got linked and I circulated to Nathan. And then we just were like, wow, there are so many parallels between... And this is coming from someone. I know nothing. I'm like the most non-musical we know, person we know nothing about especially about piano piano as well. we know nothing, nothing. jazz, and, and jazz nothing. nothing so um we thought it'd be really cool to go through this video with you guys and kind of explain maybe or, or get to dissect see what parallels what, what, are hard to leave how we because obviously it, music we is very different because what i first said was music there is not there's no competition aspect is there you know whereas in league you know it's a sport there's a, there's an end result you got to kill the nexus and there's a victory and a loss sign so like or a defeat sign so you so there's already a, a little bit of differences but we as we know mastery and entering the the quote unquote the space is something that we definitely have spoken about before so you want to dive in let's dive in so we'll pretty much just react and just share our thoughts. Yeah, I've got a bunch notes. of notes of things that I want to cover today, but let's just dive in. We'll dissect it. So just pause whenever. Yeah, yeah whenever we're ready. Yep. All right. So he, firstly, he starts by talking about the flow state, quote unquote, he calls it the space. Yeah. So this is really interesting. Again, we've talked about this before. Let's see how he, he interprets it for his field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I thought maybe we could sort of go over some of the, just some of the key points about your philosophy, how you flow into music like that and what you, you've termed the space is. Yeah. Maybe, maybe let's just start there and yeah. talk about the space. Well, the space is a place beyond the conscious mind. Okay. As we talked about before, yeah. most of the problems we're playing come in the conscious mind. Mm-hmm. That's where um, jealousy, uh, you know, envy, uh, measuring yourself against other people, measuring your value by how you play music, yeah. uh, the pressure to play better than you play, mm-hmm. uh, the pressure to make it happen by yesterday, um, all the things that make a musician's life much less satisfying than most people think it would, right. would be, mm-hmm. um, is in the mind. Yeah. Uh, that's- all right, so he's first already listed mm-hmm. off um, a lot of the pressures we put on ourselves. Oh my God. The season's ending in, in, you know, X amount of time. i got to get this goal by here. My friend's expectations. My friends say this, you know, the ego. This is the, the expectation. I think my skill level is versus the reality. So already these are just very common things we've talked mm-hmm. about on the podcast. The pressure you put on yourself. So this is interesting. So it's thinking a lot about guys of the conscious mind versus the subconscious mind. Mm-hmm. He says that the conscious mind is where all the problems are. The subconscious mind, that's that's where we want to get to. That's where we talk about muscle mm-hmm. memory and, um, you know, we're hours and act, hours and so much practice and going back well, into that that freak video that we did last week right. sort of showing, you know, he's got everything in the conscious mind, but he, but freak doesn't rely yeah. on the subconscious mind at all. Some people actually missed the point of that freak. I actually had someone, Max in the BBC uh, channel in the M- MLA, he was talking about how he said, Curtis, what was the point of like breaking down this freak video? And I said, the main point we wanted to really get across was the gap or the, the, the difference between, um, knowing, thinking, you know, something and really being able to execute upon something. And, like you said there, he has all this stuff kind of in his conscious mind, but he's not able to kind of exit that conscious mind and then enter the subconscious or like the flow state in a way. Um, <clears throat> I like what he said there is like, these are all things that make our time as a, his in his case, a, a pianist or a musician less enjoyable. Yep. And it's actually very true yeah. when you think about it. Like when you're playing, when you're having the most fun, you're not really thinking of any of that stuff. Nothing about the LP. Those are the best moments, man. When I'm just playing, moments, you're just playing. Yeah, yeah. And you're not really thinking about who's watching, whether whether you look good or look bad. You're just kind of in the moment. You're just playing. You're playing to play, and you're playing to express your best self. Very interesting how that already straight away, boom, massive parallels to 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 league. 
the good news, at least it's all in one place. Yeah. So you practice going to a space, there's nothing original about that except I call it the space. Uh -huh. It's a non-denominational name right. for something that has a name in anywhere from neuroscience to psychology to yeah. Buddhism to, yeah. you know, but for me it's a space. Mm -hmm. And what you have to do is focus on something beyond your mind. Yeah. You know, there was a really good, uh, a couple of examples of this. Um, in the movie The King's Speech. Yeah. You know that movie? Mm -hmm. I love that movie. Mm -hmm. And he can't stop stuttering. And he meets this new uh, speech therapist and he yeah. has this idea of having him listen on headphones to a, an orchestra That's right, piece, yeah. right? Yeah. And for the first time he's speaking and he's not stuttering. Yeah. And it's proving that when the mind is transposed a little bit, mm -hmm. the flow of what you're doing becomes natural. So, and everybody kind of has had that experience. Yeah. So it's a question of how do you study having that experience? How do you have that experience more often? Mm -hmm. So when I talk about going into the space, uh, as I said before, the yeah. easiest way to enter is just to stop and notice that you're breathing. So as soon as you have a thought, even like, wow, I'm really in the space, mm -hmm. you're not noticing your breathing anymore. Mm -hmm. You're noticing your thought. So a good- have you, have you found that sometimes where you're playing a really good game and then you actually sometimes realize that you're playing a really good game and then you think wow i'm playing so good and then as soon as you think that you're not you stop playing you lose focus <laughs> yeah. and then you're not in that you're not playing like you were before yeah have you had that experience absolutely and it's it's interesting because it's like almost you become you, you kind of step out of your self and then you're kind of now viewing yourself i view like a like there's two you separating and you're just kind of judging you really it's it's really weird isn't it my best games is when i go in the game and i come out like wait what just happened it's a blur it's a blur you don't actually remember yeah. really what you were thinking no or like how it felt yeah well, you kind of remember how it felt but like bits and pieces the one parallel i, I mean one dis difference i do want to mention here is that in music at least when he's talking about here uh especially like improvisate improvisation is that you know you're purely in or you're trying to purely enter that flow state in a way, right? The space. In league, do you believe that it's even good to be in the space the whole time? That's a very interesting question. Because I, I believe league, I, I say we you know how we talk about league is what 80 80% feel, 20% mm. thinking. I don't believe League is a game where you always want to be in the no, space. No, I, I don't think it would be. You I kind mean, of come in and out of the space. You need to be able to enter yeah, the space and then exit the space. Because let's say, let's let's say I've got like a lull state, right? Yeah. Where like I'm thinking about like I'm trying to like because I got to solve the problem of the wing condition, you know? Like I got to get really specific. Here you and can't. Stuff. You're not going to solve the wing condition problem uh, uh, unless, via being in the space. Uh, unless right? that I've seen, I like, I already see some pieces in my subconscious already because I've done this exact wing condition. Right. Pro I've solved that problem before. Because we are in that, we do have those games, right? Where you already just know what to do. That's right. Like you've been in this exact yeah. same situation. You know how these matchups go. You don't really need to exit the space. I, I guess we do have those, but I, I think that's an outlier. Those I, would be outliers. I don't yeah. even think that's They're, how league is meant to be played yeah. personally. Yep. I would agree. I think you're pretty spot on. I think we- Because I think league be, is- You flow in and out of you it. Flow in, you get in and out. And I like what he says there, going back to your breathing. And again, again I, I want to shout out Jono. Going back to the work that we did in Die Wolves in 2017 with the breathing and how he worked with chippies on breathing coherence. and using those lull states to bring back coherence, re-enter that space via breathing. When chippies was dead- he, Jono was was working with him. He got Chibis to take a series of deep breaths, re-enter, regain coherence, lower that heart rate to to be level-headed and continue to do his job moving forward. It's a very similar thing, isn't it? Regaining coherence, bring focusing on your breath, calming everything down, and then kind of entering that space. It's an interesting one though. But um, like I said, I just want to make that distinction. I don't believe you really want to be in the space hmm. all the time. Hmm. Way to start is to just try that. Just notice your breathing. And as long as you keep your focus on that, you're actually not thinking any thoughts. For the purpose of music, you find that space. And then it's about introducing the instrument and, and other ways of finding the space. You could look at a spot on the wall or uh, directly over your head or think of the alphabet backwards. That gets a little confusing, but um, Sometimes picture a beautiful place where you've been right. or you'd like to right. return to. So are they tools to ground you in like your present environment? Uh, that's the result, but they're tools to get you out of your conscious and subconscious mind. Yeah. It's, it's the subconscious that fears music yeah. because of previous experiences. 
It's the conscious mind that fears it today. I like that as well. And I was going over this. One of my favorite notes was it's the subconscious that fears music due to past experiences. The subconscious is very powerful because it's good and bad, right? It has positives yeah, and negatives. That's doesn't right. it? You need yeah. to rely sometimes on your, yeah. on your subconscious to be able to execute. And that's from all your experiences. But, and that's the thing. That's why it's so dangerous for the, the, that we say that our clients that have been playing the game for years, yeah. their subconscious mind, especially they've been stuck at a rank and they haven't really improved for years. Hmm. They've got, it's all the beliefs that really rock solid in grain. It's like this champion's overpowered, this champion, it sort of works yeah. against them really hard. But I would also say the subconscious attacks your things like insecurities. So, for example, let's say you're entering a game and you're in a bad mental state for whatever reason, or, or you've got you've got fears, like underlying fears, like why am I even playing league right now? I've got other things to do. Maybe I've got to study, or I've got an exam coming up, or uh, whatever, whatever it might be. These things you're not consciously thinking about, but they're just in that the back of your mind. They're just in that subconscious, laying weight, and they're actually impacting your decisions and your quality of play. And sometimes that's what we talk about reflecting, taking a step back and getting rid of all of the distractions and being honest with yourself. I want to shout out one person in the MLA that's done this really well. His name's The Grinder. I have mentioned him before on the, on the BBC. He actually sent me a 24 minute long video of him just basically talking to a camera, talking about his journeys because he's trying to go pro right now. And he's had a really tough journey, um, bouncing up and down, like up to high, you know high master, low master, back to D one. He's kind of done this whole thing back and forth, even D two. And he said one of the things that he realized was he thought that he was trying to pursue his goal, and he he was he was thinking that he was doing it, but there were things that he wasn't doing. He actually wasn't really pursuing the goal to the best of his ability, and he wasn't able to recognize the problems because he was always distracting himself. For example, he was watching, he would like, what, say he finished his block, straight away listen to music or listen to a podcast. He's doing housework, listen to a podcast, listen to music in the shower. Just always distracting his mind so he was never able to truly reflect on what he was doing. And as we've said this before, sometimes your biggest breakthroughs are going to come in the shower when you're just completely alone and there's nothing ganking you. Well, there's nothing, there's nothing that is distracting you. It's just you by yourself, you and your thoughts. That's when you're brutally honest with yourself. And he said, I was able to now find out this bullshit that was going on purely because I said, I've had enough. I'm not distracting myself anymore. I'm just going to get to the, get into the depths here. And, and he, he, he actually just kind of went on this like trail and he realized that he actually was scared of failure because he didn't think the people around him would support him if he failed. Interesting. He he said to me, he said that if I subconsciously, I wasn't able to push that next level because I didn't feel supported. And if I were to fail, I thought everyone would disown me, but it was bullshit. Like it was like, he thought his dad would be disappointed and like, you know, not want to, whatever fear he had there with his dad, his friends, he thought his friends wouldn't want to be like laugh at him and not really support him. He had like these, he felt really insecure about pursuing this journey. And that was preventing him from really going to that next level and fully exposing himself or being vulnerable to the journey. And um, he ended up having like this massive conversation with his dad. He said, he told his dad, would you like, are you proud of me? Like, are you still, are you still, would you still accept me even if I fail? And he ended up like, like breaking down to his dad and stuff. And and then he felt so much better. Like after this whole thing, he he's like really able to like- um, Move past that now. Yeah, move past that. Because that was just, he was lingering and now it's free. It's like gone. But this is in the subconscious again. He didn't even know, it just popped the up. The subconscious, again, because of past experiences and whatever it might be, that can affect you how you mm. play, how you perform without mm. even realizing it. And I think that's what he's alluding to here. Mm. One other thing I'll mention is using the word tools. We use that a mm. lot. I like how people just think that people are just like, you know, super talented and like they just go into something and they're just a beast at it, you know? But, you know, this is what a professional is like. He's saying really basic things like talk, uh, think about the alphabet backwards, stare at a space. Like this is their process to get them into that state, you know? And a lot of people just disregard this sort of stuff. It's like, oh, he's just talented. Like, oh, he must, you know, he's put, it's like they still need to do it. It's just not, doesn't magically happen. It's just the way you've got to have tools to deal with the human brain's flaws, you know, so I really another like that. interesting 
parallel, just a bit a bit tangent to this. I was watching a uh, like a stand up comedy thing, and um, this guy was compared to Dave Chappelle. And then, like, because he looked really relaxed on stage, like people were analyzing this guy's stand up performance. And the guy was like, "Yeah," he said, "Oh yeah, you've got this really like, you know, cool, calm, collected, uh, I guess, posture on stage. You look, you know, Dave Chappelle's on stage. He's always like kind of leaning over. Mm. He's on like a little stool. Mm. He looks really like in control." Mm. And what the 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 actual comedian said to this guy he said, "Well, Dave Chappelle isn't. He looks every comedian, a masterful comedian, looks comfortable on stage." But they're really not. They're actually really good at like kind of masquerading it and 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 kind of owning that they're they're uncomfortable in a way. And even though they appear to be completely flow present and, and purely comfortable, even it's the like best comedians, it's kind of an act in a way. You like put on the it's like Superman, you put on like the identity. That's and right. Mask like on. and he's saying people like Dave Chappelle, they still have to wrestle with, am I gonna bomb? Am I gonna you know, this could ruin my legacy. You know, I could have a really bad set here and then everyone's going to hate on me for this. And, you know, I don't want to ruin this Netflix special. Like they, they, they got to deal with all this. So they are dealing with this. It's not like they're immune. Mm. They're still having the same thoughts as you, even if you're a beginner, mm. but they've just, they've just learned how that to wrestle with that. The professional. that, that made, that's, that's the what experience. makes them a professional. Though. Yeah. Those little things. Those little things. Mm. And even he and Kenny Werner talks about in this where, he still has the same. He wrestles with that. He still has to wrestle with his ego and going and, in and out yeah. of the space. And, yeah. and this is someone who's probably one of the best in the world at it. It's really cool when I hear them talking about it that way. I you know? love it because it may not be everything you want it to be. Right. And the question is, why does it have to be everything you want to be? And that question is answered more from uh, the egoistic aspect of wanting to feel like a good musician. Mm -hmm. As soon as you call yourself a pianist or a drummer or whatever, yeah. the next question is unavoidable. Am I a good pianist? Yeah. Am I a good drummer? Yeah. And the problem is that in trying to answer that question when you're playing, yeah. first of all, you miss all the profound possibilities. Yeah. And it just becomes a narcissistic thing. Yeah. Am I, do I sound good? Yeah. That's the first problem. But the other problem is you don't play as well. Yeah. The reason Effortless Mastery has a, such a solid uh, identification with so many people is because yeah. you can ask out of 100 people, 99 of them, if you ask them, think about a time when you felt it was really important you played well, how'd you play? Yeah. Most people will say they could not access their most inspired playing, mm -hmm. or they even played badly. Yeah. And they so that is just the definition of, especially in the season when it's getting closer to the end rank, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's like, oh, you, you, it's sort of like the harder you try, the, the, the less results you get. In a way, which is again, it's so contradictory. Oh, it's so, it's so such weird. a back and forth, isn't it? Where it's like, it's 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 like the art of not trying. It's like an art to it in a way. You gotta like try, but you don't have to try, you know. And it's and and we we we've been trying to figure this out, right? Like, mm. how do we we talk about intensity? Mm. You need intensity, but you can't. It's like everything is the most important, but least important. You know, mm. every decision, you know, every game you play is the most important. But it's also the least important. It's not really that important at all. It's just one game in your in your journey. But how do you how do you act on that? How do you rationalize that? How do you internalize that and not overwhelm yourself? I always yourself? think it's just time. You just got to chip away at it and just. Mm. I mean, just think about overall. It's like I'm playing. I queue up. I'm playing a three block, right? I I know mm. that this is. I have goals. I know I need to play with intensity, but. Not really. I guess it's not thinking about it, sort of as he says. Like, well, you know. Well, what what he's okay. It's interesting because when when we when we dissect these things, you know, I take everything with a grain of salt because I don't believe any of this is actually solved. This is his way of entering and and pursuing mastery and, and expressing his best self. I don't believe this is the only way. We take a classic example through Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, everything was ego. Everything was making right. something personal. Yeah. It was all about making it personal. Mm. He found motivation mm. when there was something on the line and it was personal. It was he was a competitor. His his he got fuel from competition. Other people aren't like that. Other people they don't want they don't like really like the maybe the competitive aspect of league. Maybe they like the the act of just being themselves and expressing what they know and expressing champion What's mastery. Their best, yeah. And I think it's like the cup cupcake the episode, you know, talking about how when he played at his best, it's when we, when we were versing him as Diables, we pissed the legacy off. Right, yeah. You know, like we said something on camera or something like that, yeah. you know, saying that we're better than them or something. But you, I think the why we, we draw from so many areas that we all need to find what works for you. I don't think there is a 
solution. And you know what he's talking about here is, you know, as soon as you call yourself a pianist, the next that follows is, are you a good pianist? Well, some people kind of do like that. They do like kind of the, am I a good object? Am I objectively a good player? That motivates them. They they find fuel in that. It's like I want to be known as the greatest the best, of all time yeah. or the best and the best in that. But other people don't. Other people don't really want to judge how they play. And just want to be who they are. And I want to be, I just want to exit this game knowing that I played to the best of my ability. Like John Wooden. We've got John Wooden. John Wooden never mentioned the the name winning. winning. But then we've got other people like Tim Grover. Winning was a huge part of him with with Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan and stuff like that. So again, there's no there's no solution here. So I think every as we're going through this, take it with a grain of salt. If you resonate it with it and you click with it, okay, maybe we can you can try that. But you know, I just think that it, none of this is sold. These are all just tools and toolkits, things for you to try and play around with. Um, he actually says something just right after this that I do want to mention. Say, think about a time when you think it didn't matter. Yeah. They say I played better. Yeah. So that alone should prove to you that what you want to do is continue to bring down the sense of importance mm-hmm. about what see that yeah you want to bring down the sense of importance, importance and that i feel like is a great tool you know we're talking about intensity and all that stuff but one thing that i found doing is and i'm actually going to start really trying this right now in my solo queue is again it, it, it's i definitely want to win i'm not gonna i don't want to bullshit myself i'm playing to win right i'm playing to win and i care about killing the nexus at the same time, this is one game and it's not the end of the world if I don't win this game. That's bringing down the importance. Bringing down the importance. And this is why people explode with promos. Their game suddenly, even right. though they, they knew that those games were important before, suddenly the importance is raised yes. significantly. Even promos. though the promos are not going anywhere. You <laughs> no. fail promos, you can always go again. You can try again. Uh. You know, I've got another client who actually said this. He said, that's what I love about League. He says... I know that if I don't achieve my goal this year, League isn't going anywhere. He says when he plays new games, sometimes he feels stressed because the, the game's going to die. Yeah, okay. And like, like the, because that's a luxury that League of Legends yeah, has. Yeah, it's a luxury that League has. Like, think about it. When you think about most other games, there's like the first three seasons of like, the, even take Guild Wars 2, for example. Mm. Like, it's like, oh, is the game even going to live? Mm. Like, <laughs> people going to quit the game and I'm not going to have like competition? It's true. But in League... The game's just going to be around. It's okay if I don't get the rank that I'm not going to get this year because it's going to be another year. But then it gets into, am I using that as an excuse? Am I, am, I, am I dimming the importance so much that I'm using it as a, a crutch for, you know, wanting to make myself feel better for losing or not expressing my best self? That's where it gets a bit tricky there, doesn't it? What you're doing. Mm-hmm. And find a place where you're not really trying. Yeah. So the steps of effortless mastery are a, an attempt to reprogram. Yeah. So if I go into the space, if I start playing and I'm not used to that, I'm going to lose the space immediately to try to play something good. Right. So I need a, a point of contact. Mm-hmm. I have it for every instrument. It's really, it doesn't matter what instrument you're on. Yeah. So it starts by going into the space and then moving in a way where I can still focus. I, I choose to focus on the fact that I'm breathing. Mm-hmm. That immediately takes me into a space where I'm not thinking. Yeah. And then I feel, I guess it does bring in the moment, I feel the fingertips touching the keys. Right. And I'm still focusing on my breath. If yeah. I started to focus on what I wanted to do, there would be a whole change in my body and mind. And I'll bet even a chemical change. Yeah. yeah. So I stay in this space. I feel the fingertips touching the keys. I lift a finger and I play the note. And right there I go, am I now drawn into the music trap, or am I still focusing on the space? Mm-hmm. If I'm focusing on the space, I lift the next finger and I drop it. Yeah, That's where it all starts. Okay, It's learning to move, let the hand move, mm-hmm. and keep the mind out of it. Yeah. And maybe for the first time, allow your hands. It's like you're the mother and your children have been out playing, but you've never taken your eye off them. And every two minutes you had an instruction, get off the swing, sure, get off sure. the thing. You know, And now you're saying, go out and play. Just, just, yeah. It's the beginning of, instead of not being happy with anything you play, mm. it is the practice of being content with everything you play. Yeah. And people think that being content is not the way to change. It's just the opposite. As long as you're never happy with anything, you're stuck. Yeah. Starting from a place of contentment, you know, letting music develop starts by being absolutely content yeah. with the contact point and you. 
What do you think about this? So the content of what well, what he play. says was being content is not. He, he's like a lot of people believe being content is not good for change because we've been a massive advocate of painful, of painful experiences, experiences and not being content. And that's like Ray Dalio. Like. We come yeah. from Ray Dalio. His approach was painful experience, registering pain, pain leads to reflection, and then you have learnings, and then you apply those learnings, you move on. All right. So this is gonna. I'm just going down a rabbit yeah. hole in my brain yeah. right now. So when I, I view his interpretation of content differently, hmm. so when I have I have clients that beat themselves up so much, right? They, you know, we talk about they go over hmm. the painful, like it's over, the, it's over, over the top, right? Yeah. When I when I when I hear him talk about content, and when I when I, this is my my problem is when I was stuck in when I was really struggling in Diamond, is that. You know, I had like this expectation of, you know, because I was past challenge and past season and I was really struggling and it would be, yeah, super pissed off. It's like a super bad mistake. But what I needed to be content with was my level of skill and the reality mm. of this is, this is just it at the moment currently. Like I'm not, again, I view it with the word content differently. Like I have to be content with the reality that because of my, you know, my, I haven't played the game for a while, you know, X reason, whatever reason, this is just the reality of my game plan. I need to be content with that. It's more content with where I'm at now, yeah. not content with where I can be. That's right. And the journey makes sense and the where I am in the yeah. process makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of, it's, I imagine it as like this. Imagine you're watching a movie and you're at, you know, minute 20 or minute 30, wherever you pause, it's kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm content that I'm at this minute in part of the movie and it's not, I'm not content if the movie's going to end, right? I'm not content that the movie's going to end. I'm content that I'm just, I am here now and that there's, there's things to come, right? It's kind of like, that's what you're saying. You're okay, content yeah. that yeah. you're content with where you're at now. You need to be content with what you're able to do now, not with what you're you definitely pissed capable. off at where you're at, but there's, again, there's no other way because you, you can't. You just can't beat yourself up so much because mm -hmm. you can't be a challenger player. What's when we talk about acceptance? acceptance. Accepting where you're at. Yeah. Where you're at because you can't. You won't change until you accept where you're at. Especially when I was really early on in the process, like I, I was really new to you know I was relearning the game and I didn't do the three block process. Well, if you at actually think of it really in a really pragmatic way, right? You don't know what you need to improve on until you actually realize where you're at. That's because right. if, if you don't actually have a clear view of what you're capable of and where you're at, how are you meant to know what to focus your attention on? Because you're going to believe you're capable of so much more than you really are. You're just blind. You're just blind. You're delusional yeah. about what you're capable of. So I think what he means, at least what, yeah, I think you're spot on the way I'm interpreting it as well is it's being content with your ability it's being content with what you're demonstrating. If I express my best self, whatever happens, happens. That's right. There's nothing There's nothing else I can do. No. I mean, if you think about it, if I try my best, what's there not to be content about? Let's say I was, I've never baked a cake in my life, right? Mm. I do my, I bake my first cake, right? And the result comes out pretty, you know, pretty average. Like it didn't taste or what I expected. Or let's say I'm trying to copy my mom's recipe or something like that. I have to be content because I have zero experience. You know, yeah. I, 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 this is my level of skill. Uh, yeah. I can't be. Uh, but, why would you get angry over but, it? Yeah. Wow. It doesn't make it doesn't sense. Make if sense. I beat myself, it's like, why is this not as good I, as my mom? I literally mom's? roasted a client for this the other day. His name Ryan, new person in the MLA, right? Um, he, he said, he wrote me his mini essay that says something along the lines of Curtis. I just get so angry and so pissed off when I like I get tilted I'm so tilted I'm thinking of taking a week break because I get so angry after my games what do you do when you're tilted I said Ryan how many games are you playing right now how what's your schedule like that's the first thing I ask now yeah. are you playing three blocks etc etc yeah. right and he's barely played and I said to him I said I actually said how dare you how do you even feel entitled it's it's, it's how that, entitled do you have to so be angry. to feel angry yeah and, and I, I had another client with the same thing. And this is the analogy I use. To, and, and I said, this is a bit of a weird analogy and it might sound a bit crude, but I really want to get across my point. Imagine you are playing little league baseball as an eight-year-old kid. And you're, and, and so you're an eight-year-old kid and, um, and you and your and your and your little buddy messes up something, and then you start having a hissy fit because your eight year old kid, your friend, messes up something. It's inevitable that people are going to mess up and make mistakes because you're all just eight year old little kids who just started playing baseball for the first time. That's where this guy he's in gold, right? That's the analogy I use. Mm. How can you expect otherwise? Because he's getting angry at other people in his games. I'm like, you know, like just for, let's just accept where you're at. This is all tying back to acceptance. Because and it's easier said than done. Because I think 
League is not a game where it's very clear what your skills are. You know, it's not like we, right. it's not like you're, you're, you. I always say it tricks you. If you get a pentacle, yeah. you think you're the best player in the world, right? You can get a pentacle against these level of players, yeah. but that doesn't mean that you're a diamond player. And, and your your level of play is not represented by one game. It's represented by many games, many, many, That's many right. games. Yes. That's why you need to play a lot of games to actually see what's going on. What are you actually capable mm. of doing? Mm. Take a step back. So yeah, this whole this journey of acceptance and contentment, it's it is easier said than done. It's, 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 it can be quite difficult. To, and then this is not even to mention your journey. If you're a lot old school lot league player, it's even harder. And your friends have been hyping you up saying you're really that good. Imagine your friends saying you're the best in our French group. You're, you're, you're a diamond. You're amazing. What's the first thing you're going to do? Well, it must be my teammates that's holding me back as my friends. So everyone thinks yeah. I'm awesome. I'm the best player. So yeah, this is a, this is an interesting concept. And I think something we need to explore more there, contentment. Maybe everything's not about painful experience. Maybe it actually starts more with the acceptance of where you're at. And then, he, you know, I think he said something there about contentment doesn't mean you're happy. Happiness can stifle change. Because if you're happy with something, that's different, right? That's different. It's yeah. different. Because if you're happy with where you're Tenant at, and happy, contentment, two different it, things. Is it, did I interpret that correctly? Is I can't it, remember what Let's he, just rewind. See what he says. He okay. says about happiness here. Starting from a place of contentment, you know, letting music develop starts by being absolutely content yeah. with the contact point and you and allowing things to move. Yeah. That's whether you're playing in a form, you know, you may want to play a million notes in that form. I think he goes back here. As go long as you're never happy bit. with anything, is the yeah, practice of being That's content right. with everything you play. Yeah. And people think that being content is not the way to change. It's just the opposite. As long as you're never happy with anything, you're stuck. Yeah. Starting from a place of contentment you know, letting music develop. So as long as you're never happy. By being absolutely content. Because that's not what your point yeah. is. With you're, the, you're, what you're trying to say, Kurt, is that he's, oh, he's saying- Oh, he's saying if you're, if, sorry, if you're never happy, then you're, you're stuck. Yeah. Right, got so you. I think happy and content So he's actually the combining them together. Yeah. That's interesting because I, I frame them very differently, mm. but that's just me. Mm. When I think of contentment, I don't think of happiness. You know what I mean? I think my definition would be happiness. It would be happiness. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Okay, we're getting bogged down. We're very, becoming very... Yeah. I think with, like, contentment, it's like... And this adds into Ray Dahlia as well. Be content in your execution, but then be hypercritical in the reflections. Because, like, he's, he's saying you need to be content while you're playing. Right. So, content... So, so what our producer here is saying is that be content during the execution, but but not content... Be hypercritical in the, in the, in the reflection, so in, in the, the review. review. Right, right. Like while you're playing, you don't want to be reviewing as you play. Mm. That's when like the next Yeah, you don't want to be reviewing while you play because then you're, yeah. yeah. All right, we'll continue on here. Contact point and you and allowing things to move. Yeah. That's whether you're playing in a form. You know, you may want to play a million notes in that form, but maybe all it wants to come out is a few notes in that mm -hmm. form. Mm -hmm. It's being t attuned to how the body wants to play the instrument. Yeah. And it becomes more organic and definitely more authentic. Yeah. So as just at the beginning of this uh, this lesson here, when he did that improvisation, it was fascinating to see how you kind of built into different layers of intensity. Does that feel any different when you like? Are you are you in the space at different depths there when you're kind of in this? In yeah, I mean, I, yes. You know, it's very much when people are improvising. I say to them, don't let your ego get ahead of the fingers. Right. Because next thing you know, you feel like you're trying to catch up with something, yeah. catch up to something. Uh -huh. And so I could feel that happening, and then I kind of pull back Got your, right. because I'm used to being in the space. Mm -hmm. So it'll inf affect my phrasing. Right. Um, actually, it didn't feel that organic because I thought to myself, I told you I would do that Keith Jarrett fan. Right. And yeah. when I did it, I actually didn't feel like doing it. Oh, you got... Which oh, was weird. So yeah. I violated the thing myself. Okay. But then I accepted that I'm violating the thing. Yeah. There's just... There's always a reason to be discontent. You can even get into this new age headspace where like, oh, I'm not in the space. Yeah. And now you're fighting with that. Right. So the game is whatever your mind's telling you, go. Yeah, it's, and then it goes into a vicious cycle. Yeah. It's like I'm trying to get into the, to the zone, I, into I the I love phone. that quote though. Like I, there's always a reason to be discontent. Yeah, there is, 100%. Especially with just how we're wired, right? <laughs> yeah. How humans are wired. We always want more. We always want to be better. Yeah. If we're going backwards, oh my God. If we're staying the same, oh my God. Hmm. Thank you for that. I'm not in the space. Thank yeah. you for that. Sure, sure, I'm sure. not inspired now. Thank you. 
I love oh, that. That That's is great, right? That was one of my favorite parts of the entire interview. Like it's everything that happened, thank like, you for thank that. Thank you. Awesome. I'm, I'm, Imagine I'm, having that as a mantra. Yeah. How cool. That would be such an interesting thing to play with. I'm going to like just play around with that. I'm going to try that myself. So what would be an example in, one, in your, one of your games? Uh, let's say, again, it could, I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to do it in game. Mm. Like, like if I die, say something like something goes wrong and like I have to adapt and I'm, I'm dead. And I'm, I'm, all right. Thank you for that. What do I got to do now? Like legit try and embrace it. I like, lose focus in my thing. Okay. Even that as well. Thank I lose focus. Thank you for that. All right. That was a shitty thing. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm going to try it. I'm going to really have a crack. It's sort of just it, the way that I view that. I actually think of David Goggins sitting down with, you know, he talks about sitting down, having a, having a dinner or a cup of coffee with the devil mm. and his demons. Mm. It's sort of just like, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation. The most like, important conversation you have is the one you have with yeah. yourself. It's sort Thank of just like, spitting in your ego you, in a way. Nathan you're all really good at this you, you've always inspired me by saying this thing you said we're all just just monkeys yeah, and, like and you're really good at not taking yourself too seriously and mm -hmm. I think that's you've that's one of your big strengths as a as a person in everything that you've done you've you're really good at detaching your ego from something and kind of just being like what are we doing? Like, we're so wrapped up in, we think we're so important. We think everything we're doing is so important. I, I like to, I like to always jab and look at the humor in things, right? Yeah. And especially when people think their problem's really big, right? You know, it's just thinking, you know. But you're very good at getting perspective. It's about perspective. It's about yeah. perspective, yeah. right? And I think that's what, again, that's how I'm interpreting that. Thank you. It's just one little thing, hmm. right? It's just one roadblock. <clears throat> Um, and I, I and 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 I'm actually want to do a shout out here to uh, even Jimmy McGill from Better Call Saul. I love taking inspiration from characters in in, in shows that I watch. And for those of you who've seen Better Call Saul, that character is all about dealing with adversity. In my opinion, overcoming like he's so stoic in a we in a weird way. He's like he just trucks along. Yeah, he just like, keeps moving forward. Just keeps moving <laughs> forward. It's like thank you for that. Thank you for that. He, he just does. deals with the next thing, yeah. the next thing. Yeah. No matter how much shit is thrown at him, and obviously he digs himself these holes. But mm. there's so yeah, there's so many uh, I guess area uh, uh, ways we can find this in other in other areas. I guess, but um. Yeah, it's a cool, it's a cool little thing. Another tool. It's another tool. Yeah. Thank you for that. Well, throughout this entire day, because we've been talking about this stuff, and we've been talking about the application not only for piano, but for guitar, for drums, and even just for life, like we've been talking about. And this whole, this kind of like running thought in my head has been learning to try to not try, basically. And, and right. Kind of that's where you that. get. That's the tricky part. That's yeah. the spider web right there. Well, that's why you need a point of contact, and that's why the first step is the first step. Okay. If I say, wherever the hand goes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Like in the second step, you make sounds and you actually guide a little bit of thinking. You think, mm -hmm. that's the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. Yeah. The equivalent of enlightenment in music is that every sound you make is the most beautiful sound you've ever heard. Yeah. So a melody, you only have trouble melody because you're fighting through your own judgment mm -hmm. to try to make a melody. Yeah that kind of uh, discretion mm -hmm. in a real-time situation. Mm -hmm. You just have to receive it. Yeah. And if there's something you don't like about it, that's, you take care of that and you're practicing. Yeah. So it's a radical acceptance when you're in this kind of... Acceptance creates the flow. Acceptance creates the flow. But I love what he says. If there's something you're not happy about, you deal with that in the practice. And something that we really need to really... We need to hone in on here, Nathan, is... Mastery is a byproduct of a lot of practice. That's you right. know, everything we're talking about here today, entering the space, is not something you can do until you've done the work. Yeah. Uh, if you actually go back in this interview, he says, I've spent a lot of time in the space, so like I'm used to it. He literally said, I'm used to being in the space. So he literally even is acknowledging there that you, this requires a lot of time. But I, I, but I would say that's space. two things though, Nathan. There's practice, uh, someone who is a quote-unquote master of their craft or master of that specific thing entering the space and practicing being in that space but then there's also practicing to get to a point of mastery you know what i mean of so course. like for example we talk about the game only really starts at master right where what we mean by that is that that's when you've got to a level of mastery where we're really able to combine the concepts and play to kill the nexus properly 
using everything, chair mastery and the fundamentals and you've got the map awareness. We're now playing versus competent players. Everyone's competent on the map now across the board. So I think what we really need to distinguish here is that if you haven't put in the work and you don't have that chair mastery, none of this is that, possible. That's right. None of it. And this matters. is something he talks about a bit later on. We're going to get into it and it's actually ties into my- Well, I don't know. I think that it still does. I mean, you know, I could definitely would think many a times people, because, you know, we said that mm. everyone's had the experience. People definitely have had the experience of being in a, in a flow zone or, or you the mean space. In, in, in league? In league, in any rank. To, yeah, to differing to a degrees, degree. maybe. I don't know if I agree with that, though. But we'll get into it. There's some other things in this. In- I would say that those, again, those would be the rare games where I view it as like everything's just like a very simple solution. Like, let's say I view it as like- It's like a, a situation that you've been in. But th- that person, in, in order to enter the space, Nathan, that person would have had to see that situation or know exactly what to do in that situation. Yeah. Based off past experience, I have many. Like when when my Olaf guide came out, right? I had I had many of my gold and platinum students that were just executing perfectly because there was a very big structure, right? Mm. Like let's say if they full right. cleared into double kill bot, into right. reset, into clearing and get dragon. So there's like reset, very Herald, short elements of that. It. That yeah, was yeah, yeah, short elements yeah, of it, yeah. and they were able to flow through the game. So they would yeah. still be able to, but that's but, but that thing they've practiced. They've practiced, they've practiced that. that. But 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 the the. The point where they, you know, they're not going to be able to ride that all the, all the way is that when there's X factors, when they're getting vaded, when they don't get that double kill bot, when they yep. don't get that dragon, that's when they start. Yeah. That's when their that's actual when skill the level. <laughs> that's when the actual skill level yeah. will show because they're not solving difficult problems. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you can only be in the space when you've actively really practiced it and you've done the work. There's no, there's no like hiding that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, this is yeah. a beautiful sound, right? But so is this. Uh And that was an accident. Uh But those kind of accidents happen when you allow the thing to flow the way it wants to flow. You get intuitions about how it might resolve that you weren't thinking about. Yeah. But when you try to create it from the beginning of the flow, it doesn't flow. Right. And when you follow the flow, it's quite uh, profound. You then get caught up. But to me, it. that's the actual excitement of music. Yeah. Is watch, and, and jazz musicians, you see that they're, they're willing to move. Mm. Now, of course, they've moved in those places before. There's no yeah. such thing as playing differently every time you play. Sure. That's a, that's a myth. Yeah. Because we're not computers. We only have a few ways of going through it. Yeah. But at receiving it and going, if you don't like the way you go through it, yeah. you reprogram it and you're practicing, yeah. and it takes time to reprogram where your hands would go. Yeah. But if you accept where your hands go. I love what he said before as well, Nathan, with the, um, you can't do something that you haven't practiced. I mean, that's a, what, I don't, you know, you can only do what you've practiced. Like, we're not computers. You can't just randomly pull stuff that you haven't you've done. Never done before. Again, I want to tie that back to the freak thing. You can talk about it. You might even know about it. But if you haven't done it, you can't just do something you don't know. It's like the example, you or you haven't it. felt it. You haven't felt it, It's yeah. like, for example, with a great example, and a lot of people messaged you out, that was like blown away. It's like when he said, do you remember he's walking out of base? And he goes, oh, I need to be careful of Twitch. <laughs> Right, mm. like you know, and he literally like the second after he says that, you know, he the enemy supports like obviously baiting, and the twitch is around, and he just gets caught chunked by the twitch. Remember that? Mm-hmm. And it's that's just such a great example of because he hasn't he hasn't felt like what does the su- support be there mean? Like what does that mm. feel like? You know, like obviously twitch is around if the supports in that mm. position. Yeah, yeah, and I just I did, I, did, I think we really want to I just want to highlight that like if you haven't prepared. If you don't know what it's like, if you don't know what it feels like to CS perfectly or to, to to hit all these creeps or you don't know what it feels like to hit these skill shots and you haven't done that again and again and again, you're not randomly going to be able to do it just because you're in the flow state. That's right. You know? Yeah. The, the, the space is about, allows you to, to express what you know. You're not going to express something that you don't really know how to do. You know. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not magic because what you haven't practiced won't be played. Right. But when you think about it, 
it doesn't happen anyway. You try to play things that you haven't practiced, <laughs> yeah. and it just sounds sloppy yeah. and, and out of control. Practicing and playing are, playing are very separate. Okay. If your practicing is inspiring, you should be suspicious. Mm, okay, there we I mean, go. You, I love that so much. What does that mean to you? Like, like practice and play are different in mm. the sense that, um, okay, let's say you when when you're practicing something you're not able to do it really confidently like you're, you're working you're building that muscle memory in a way so for example let's say we talk about champ mastery let's say you're trying to you're, you're you're trying to learn a new like a new champ and you're getting the clear down pat you know we see this all the time in competitive play right where someone quote unquote thinks they know how to play a champion and then when it when when push comes to shove and they play that on the competitive stage and it's time to compete what happens they crumble because they don't actually know how to do it. When they when it's time to to really execute, their muscle memory isn't there. So the way I view it is again tying back to the to kind of the, the master tier thing. It gets to a point in league where you're that's why I says when I say about learning a champion, it takes around, in my opinion, to to really get to the nitty-gritty with the champion, at least a hundred games. Right, a hundred games means you, to me. If you play with intensity, those hundred games, like you can now enter the space. In my opinion, um, everything before that, you're just trying to you're, you're you're trying to brute force stuff in a way. You have to think about what you're doing rather than yeah. let it play itself. Like I had to think about my charms. So you know what, what he's saying is that if you're at game thirty and you think this is awesome re gameplay or something, that's right. It's something you, you should be, be cautious. That's right. It's, it's, it's something's going wrong there. Yeah. Either you're delusional, yeah, or yeah, so something weird's going on there. Or again, right. going back to that Olaf example and like some you did it once. Just because you've done it once and, doesn't mean you can do it all the time. And then all the, everything clicked. All the situation, the enemy team fell over themselves. Everything clicked perfectly. So again, you should caution. Or the in enemy terms walked of into your chart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. like over and over again. That's right. Yes, yeah, like, I'm so good at Yeah, time back to just because you've done it once or twice doesn't mean yeah. you can do it every single time. Yeah. Yeah, spot on, yeah. Probably not getting anything done. Yes. And fair. also, practicing, the less things you practice, the deeper you can get into them. Yeah. A lot of you guys are overwhelmed by the amount of stuff you're working on, and you don't know what to do first, and you know how long to do it. Yeah. Well, once you establish an ease with the instrument, whether it's a drum, you know, if I had the drums, I would do it the same way, but of course I'm not a drummer. Yeah. But it's the same thing, I go into the space, I pick up a stick, it's that I'm in the space. Yeah. And I start to establish a place where my mind is at rest, my body is connecting with the act because my mind's not interfering. Mm -hmm. Now I start to test all the things I already know. Yeah. How well do I know them? Yeah. If I go into that space, can I play a beat? Yeah. If I go into that space, can I play that time or whatever? Uh -huh. One level of player has to tense up in order to make it happen. Right. For another level of player, it's muscle memory. Yeah. So if he wants a sweat, that's fine. If he yeah. wants a dance, that's fine. Yeah. But he can connect with the universe yeah. while his body plays the beat. Right. That's what I call effortless mastery. Mm -hmm. There is mastery where people can play different styles or someone's very technical. Yeah. But then effortless mastery is that you know it when you see it. Yeah. Say, what they're doing is amazing, but it looks like it's all pre-programmed. Mm -hmm. I would refer... You know who this is? Bo. Bo is the perfect representation of exactly what he just said. Everything when you watch him play, it actually looks like it's pre-programmed. Mm. That's when we had this conversation about Bo. We're talking about, you said, it, it almost looks like he's playing everything via on like his muscle memory. Everything he's doing looks- Effortless. Effortless. Yeah. It's yeah, just, even like he's clear, is he clearing? Like It's just so- Moving, his like, movement. Casual. Every, on, on all these champions, it's so casual. The skirmishing is so flawless, but in a casual way. Mm. He's playing game after game mm. after game with the most blocks. flawless skirmishing you could possibly have. Mm. Not missing skill shots, perfect clears, perfect kiting, going in and out range, per, like threat assessment. Playing out of vision. Playing out of vision, like invading perfectly, never getting caught. Like just, just absolute flawless gameplay. It actually looks pre-programmed. Like it doesn't look like he's trying. Mm. Because it's all ingrained. It's all this stuff is muscle memory. His skirmishing is such a high level. And I spoke to Sixer this morning. He was saying, well, that's what happens when you're being top 10 in Korean solo queue for four seasons in a row. That's right. Yes. You're playing thousands of solo queue games in every that season game space. in that level of play, yeah. in that space. Thousands of games for four seasons in a row. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. Again, everyone thinks he came out of nowhere. He's been, <laughs> he's been literally he's, top 10 for four seasons in a row. Yeah.
<laughs> right? He just happened to play on. Uh, Everyone's uh, like, oh my god, he went to Think EUS. It, he's actually gone down. He's playing on Korea where the skirmishing is way better. Yeah. He's actually gone backwards. He's gone to a server where the skirmishing is worse. Mm. So for him, it's just free flow. He can just kind of do whatever he wants because the skirmishing is so low level comparatively. Mm. You know, that's that's effortless mastery. Right Great there. example. Bro is the perfect representation. To uh, a couple of things. There's, uh, and I mentioned them in my book, yeah. uh, Vladimir Horowitz playing in Moscow. I think it was around 1980, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, returning at the first, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but watch him as he starts playing this Scarlatti. He actually puts the body in a position to play the music and then he watches. Right. It's very powerful. The language will come out as you receive the impulses of how you're gonna play it okay. is the message. Right. What it even means is not something to be thinking about at the time you're playing. Because mm -hmm. you're imp superimposing something. So the most natural way to play is this instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, I am finally working on another book yeah. and after 20 years, and it's called uh, Everless Mastery 2, but Becoming the instrument. Becoming the instrument. There's one thing much higher than being a player, yeah. and that's being the instrument. Because mm -hmm. once you're the instrument, it. All right, so we've talked about this we before, have haven't this. we? Becoming the champion. Becoming the champion. Getting into the to the to the mic, like literally knowing the why. Feeling. It's the why. Again, we talk about brain being back to the Simon Sinek. Start with why. The three circles. There's the why, the how, and the what. The why in the middle is the most powerful form of knowing. When you know why a champion wants to do something or why I need to behave in this way, that's when change is permanent. That's when change really is instilled in your gameplay. So if you don't know why, as your champion, you need to be making these decisions, then you don't know your champion. You mm. won't be able to do that reliably. Mm. When the game state changes, you won't even know what to do. Mm. Why does Evelyn need to do this in this game state? Why? Because, okay, Evelyn, blah, blah, blah. You can just, you can just go, why does Rexai need to be in this, need to be thinking like this in this game. Why? And you, you can rip that off. Boom, boom, boom. This is why, exactly why, because I can't do that. I need to be doing that. You'll be able to say all these things because you know why. You are Rek'Sai in those games when you're playing your highest. You know, you and Rek'Sai are just one. There is no difference. That's mastery. That's how you get the effortless mastery as well. You can't have that effortless mastery if, you don't, if you're not one with the champion. Some powerful shit right there. Love it just happens. Now, you can take that wherever you want. You can be, and many players you see, they are the instrument. Yeah. Maybe they have a sense of humor, maybe they're thinking about dinner later, yeah. maybe they're looking at someone in the audience yeah. and thinking about what might happen later. <laughs> maybe they're thinking about God. Yeah. Maybe they're in the sphere, you know, yeah. in universal consciousness. Yeah. All that's only possible when you're not down here managing the instrument. And all the, all the performances that have inspired you, if you go back and look at them now, mm -hmm. with that thought in mind, you go, oh, there's it, there it is. Yeah, this is something that is accessible to any Anyone, level and you can take your first lesson and decide to own it rather than just fluff through it and go yeah. on to the next lesson. Yeah. Decide, I wanna know what it feels like for this to be in me, and yeah. then for like one beat, you're a drummer. Mm -hmm. that, I love that so much, yeah. For one beat, you're a drummer. What, did I just press something? Yeah, I think or, you just went back to the start, Gator, so oh, we're going to have to go find a uh, way. Anyway, um, he said that for one beat, you're a drummer. That's actually kind of where I wanted to end it anyway, okay. personally. Um, for one beat, you're a drummer. Again, let's say you're talking about your Olaf clients who watch your guide, right? And they know how to do that first clear and you know, maybe get that first gank off. For, for that four minutes, they are a challenger Olaf. Think That's about right. It. Yep. <laughs> Think about that. Yep. For Everything's one, perfect. For four minutes, they can be a challenge. Over. I I think I did a diamond review to, you, to this week, and uh, their early game was flawless. Everything was absolutely perfect. I wouldn't do no nothing differently. But then we got into some other situations. Yeah. That game, right. and we're back down to but, diamond. But the thing is, is like what I love about that though is that when you own that, and I think this ties back more to Patrick as well when he was playing his Olaf and his Zach. Mm. You practice something so much that you just know. Like, you know what it feels like to have your mental stack freed up. Imagine going into, imagine you're a gold player, right? And everything you've done up until that point was playing many champions, not having any idea why you're doing anything, to then having a bit of direction and knowing exactly why and what you need to do in this first four minutes. For that four minutes, you've gone from being completely overwhelmed and not really understanding anything to finally actually playing League of Legends. Imagine how eye-opening that would be and just the way your mindset would shift. It was like, okay, what would that, how can I 
how can I now have that for another few minutes? How can I then now once you've got that you've you've got that feeling because it's a feeling. Feel, yeah. It's the feeling of yeah. you feel completely and utterly in control. Mm. Nothing can put you, can 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 confuse you in those moments. Mm. Clarity. Clarity. You have clarity and your mental stack is freed up and you're thinking, "Whoa, I'm actually playing league now. I can now understand why Nathan is able to think about wing cons and do blah 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 blah. I can understand how he's able to pan his camera to sides. I understand how he's able to then do all these other things while he's doing his because he knows it's muscle man. And you, once you have that connection with it and you've made that connection with league, that's when the respect for the game also starts to come in. Because people always tell me, Curtis, I read, I talk about Kari playing Vex. He said to me when he moved to other champions, I just don't have that feeling. There's a feeling that I'm missing that, that I can't control, have. That control. That clarity. That's what Sham Mastery is so good. I love important. that for one beat, that person feels like a, a drummer. Yeah. <laughs> that's so cool. For one clear, that guy is a challenger player. Great analogy towards that. There was one more thing I wanted to talk about in this. I'm just going to try and okay. find it. So it plays itself. Yeah. Then you can, if you're wondering, why don't I have that joy that I see people playing with? Yeah. What's missing? Or even musicians, they've been lifelong musicians, but something's always been missing. Yeah. What's been missing is you. Yeah. You know? So, uh, in some cases, what's been missing is the foundation. Okay. If you never had to pay, and again, it's ego that would cause you to skip the foundation. Yeah. Because you wanted to sound creative by day one. Uh, uh -huh. So you skip little things like four bar phrases, yeah. eighth notes. Yeah. A jazz player, for example, if a the way I interpreted this section, Nathan, was um, let's say you never develop that mastery, right? Let's say let's say um, you're the type of player that plays all the champs in your pool to an average degree. I get a lot of clients that have like five or six champs in their pool, right? Yep. So they're, they're literally at their rank purely because they manipulate the draft to only play perfect champions in the perfect situations. Situation, yeah. And they get their rank because of that. They don't get their rank because they've actually got that champ mastery and know how to overcome difficult situations, right? So let's say that six champ, that six champ pool. When you're, when you're average at everything, the, there actually is no opportunity to to express you as a player. There is no creativity. There is no, this is my interpretation of X champ. It's you're just doing the cookie cutter, basic, mediocre style. You can win a game. It's like, uh, let's say your champion's like really good in this game. Yeah. You can play that champion at six and win that game. That's correct. But if you're playing a champion that's not in, um, you know, not good in that game, you have to play at a 10 to win that game. That's when you're going to get really like, this is the but way that's the where be your played. interpretation comes out though. That's right. That's where you, that's what he's saying. So for some people, they never get that. They never feel that because they're not actually expressing them as a player. That's why I always tell people play two champs, play them in hard games, play them. No, but also so I say, play them the way you want to play them. What feels good for you in your server, in your rank, in this game? What feels good? I'm not here to tell. I don't want to tell you. I have my way of winning this game. Based off my experiences, my server, my rank. You're going to have your version of winning this game. I don't believe in objectively the only one cookie cutter solution to winning every game. There are many ways you can win a game. And there's people that's been proven over time, time and time again. You can, your rec side, you can lane gank that side and snowball that side. You might think, oh, it's actually better for me to play bot side that game. And you play bot side instead. Another rec side might gank mid that game. Another Rex I might stack dragons. Another Rex I might not. At the end of the day, the result of the end, you still win the game. But how you want to do it is very different. We see this all the time with people specializing in a particular way of playing their champion. We see the one tricks that specialize in a particular way of playing electrocute Rex I, Halo Blades Rex I, or whatever. They have or their own. Like, uh, I always think of like a singe, like a roaming singe or something like that. Or but there's even different styles of singe. That's mm. the point. But I think what I what I what I gather from this was that. When you have that mastery, you get to experience adding the flavor of you in there, have your spin on it. I have a, my example is Volley Bear is really people love going the chem tank, you know, the whole like chase you down. But my my interpretation of the champion and the way I do it is like I don't chase people. So I want people to come to me and okay. I go to the Sunfire like full tank. Right. Because with Chem Tank, you're a bit squishy if you don't go Sunfire. So that's a great demonstration of the right. difference. Yeah. You know? And my Volibear is very successful. I have like a 65% 60, win rate. I'm, I'm, Perfect I'm, example of your interpretation of Volibear. Yeah. And, you know, everyone, and I, I even I even mentioned uh, 
um, someone who's latched on, one of my clients who's latched on to my version of it, he tried to play the chem tank one, one game. And like, it was just two different mm, champions. Mm. And I said, just, I know that this actually makes sense yeah. in this game, but trust me, I've done this before. Just yes. play some by still and embrace your identity and yes. you actually can still win. I, 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 Milk Puddle, we know Milk Puddle. He's a massive advocate of this. He plays Zed. Yeah. And he always see people trying to optimize their, their Zed build by going Conqueror and Eclipse. He's then, like, then if they- get the damage. He's like, if they just all in on their identity as assassinating the squishies and going, mm. you know, dust blade, ghost blade, mm. electrocuting knight, Sure, you're not going to be able to deal with some of those other members, but you don't need to. No. You just one shot their AD carry every single fight, mm. and that's it. Your There's always going to be one squishy member. There's always going to be one squishy member, like all in in your identity. You might that have way, less options one game, but but at least you know what to do and, and again, how to do and it. And again, those games just you become so much better at the champion yeah. style when yeah. when you learn how to win those games. I do think though, at the highest level of mastery, you actually should dip in between them. Like I feel as though, at least for like some mid champs, like Ari, like or Victor. True mastery is the ability to switch to, between. To switch between I do them. agree. Like, well. although you might yeah. have a tendency to lean towards one of them, yeah. you should be able to alternate between them. Agreed. Um, at the highest level, anyway. Yeah. I used to. I would do this with uh, Udia, the phase rush. You know, mm. for, if I'm going to get carded versus mm. going the lethal tempo conqueror. Right. Yeah. As well. Was there anything you wanted to touch on this? Uh, there's another. There's just another part here. I think it's closer to the end. I'm quickly overwhelmed. Yeah. By everything. Yeah. It puts me in a space of absolute clarity. Yeah. And what agrees with that space... It's funny how we're using the same words. This is the first Everyone time we use clarity. Clarity, yeah. Yeah. What agrees with that space. Yeah, if I'm practicing something, if I'm practicing eight bars and it takes me out of the space, I yeah. try practicing four bars. Okay. I'm a little more in the space. Yeah. I'm practicing two bars, I'm a little more in the space. I yeah. may practice this bar and I'm really in the space. Yeah. That will change your playing. Mm -hmm. Not even aware of. Yeah. If you keep taking your hands off, the piano will flirt with you. Oh, okay, yeah. here we go. This so this is, is one of the things. And one of the things I also urge everybody is after each repetition, take your hands off the instrument. This is one of the most powerful things I found. Yeah. All right, so what he's saying here is, so he plays something and then his hands off. Mm. This is three blocks. Mm. All right, and stop in. Stopping even after if, the game. Even if, even if, you know, you're, you're playing really well, just like, like, just get off reflect a little mm, bit you know it, it, mm. like uh, he'll go on to describe it a bit more let's get let's yeah. we'll, we'll finish the clip off and then we can talk about it yeah. but i want you to feel it in that land back you feel fresh uh -huh. when you keep your hands on there you tend to build up a tension that you're not even aware of yeah if you keep taking your hands off the piano will flirt with you yeah, yeah, say yeah. but what about that sound yeah that's beautiful <laughs> that's beautiful and i'm also done again what yeah. oh come back <laughs> and what happens is no matter what you play there's no reason to like that but it sounds beautiful sure. because First of all, my mind is only focused on one thing. Yeah. Mmm, delicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm done. So when you are detached. <laughs> So you're taking the hands off. You know, he said there's this tension. When you play it's lots tension. of games in a yeah. row, tension builds even if you're not aware of it, man. And I've 100% I, 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 I think I even need to do this after each game. Yeah. I, I always feel terrible when I don't leave my computer. Yeah. When I, when I play a game and I review and I don't leave my desk, I just, I just feel like tension building up in my body and my mind. You, you do, don't you? Oh, I, I need to just, just God, actually, walk. I did walk. I used to walk, especially because our queue times are really long. No, you know what? What I, 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 I have an, a, an excuse, but yeah. I'm gonna destroy myself for this one. Is that I'm on because I, I, I unmute and kind of talk through the game with my oh, people on the Discord, yeah. and so that I'm in queue while I'm talking, yeah. and then we get into a conversation, and then the next queue pops. pops. So what I should do is I should maybe do that review. Then, then mute and, and go off for a while, walk away, and then come back a few minutes, you know, two minutes later, and then get back on. That's what I should do in reality. That's mm. the ultimate mm. reset there. I like that a lot. That's something I'm going to implement as well. All right. Well, that's it for, what's his name again? Oh, Kenny Werner. Name? Kenny Werner, Effortless Mastery. It's really funny. So how long have we been going? It's, an hour? Do you want to do maybe one, one, one topic, Nathan? Or do you want to go straight to mailbag? Uh, I think we just dive into the mailbag. To be yeah. Honest. I think that's a good good one there. Um, I just want to mention again, it's so funny. Like, we'll not title this epi episode, like, Effortless Mastery. And it's like, it's the opposite of what we like, effortless, like, mastery takes a lot of work. Yeah. It takes, you know, but but again, it's like getting, it's like put, putting in the work to get that's to right. a stage where it looks effortless. Um, I actually do want to quickly talk about one thing very quickly if that's okay go ahead um i've actually had quite you know we talk about losers game 
right? And the loser's game in capitalizing on other people's mistakes. I've actually had a client recently who he actually over-indexed on the loser's game to the degree where he didn't feel like he needed to think proactively. And he used loser's game as a crutch to, to think, oh, well, they're going to make mistakes. If I just sit here and CS, I'm going to win. But that's not really what loser's game is. Loser's game, yes, there is an element of that, but you still need to use... You need to really think. So you know what I mean. So losers game, winners game. They came from tennis, right? That's correct. So the way that I the analogy, right, is that um, the the losers game analogy is that you're just waiting for them to do the hard shots, and they'll eventually just by sheer if you just keep just knocking it back, just yeah, making sure it's hundred right. percent in. Eventually, they'll fall over themselves. That's correct. But that person is still hitting. He's still it. hitting it. He's, He's still, still, still doing hit his it. job. He's not just like just standing there and waiting for it. Because you know? yeah. You might win by doing that. They might actually, you might actually drop your tennis racket on the ground and they hit into there. That could happen. Yeah. But it's unlikely and you want to be ready. You still want to do it because, because he's playing Annie, right? And like he says, he's doing these things and he got into mid game and he's like, he's not, he's just literally standing under the tower type thing. Like he's, <laughs> like, I'm like, dude, so you're an Annie. That's the analogy of just literally just dropping the racket. Dropping he's, not the even, racket. he's not even throwing a he's little bit of ball. Thinking. Easy, sim- simple ball. Like he's not even trying to think. Yeah. You still got to try to think about being mm. proactive. Like, okay, well, they're all moving in this area. Maybe you should just bush camp there. Like have a crack. Get creative. Like try get creative, you know? Like you're not going to be great at it, but it doesn't mean you can't think. So I just want to send a word of warning out there. You know, I think there are dangers to over-indexing a loser's game. And yeah, like you said, Nathan, you still have to think and do your job. That doesn't mean you can drop the tennis racket. You still got to hit it into still the court. still got to hit it. Yeah. So just something to keep an eye on. Keep an eye on out there. I'm sure there's other people who are struggling with the same thing. I like it. All right. Go back. Away we go. song all right first question here is from ian the title of this email is playing normals with ranked mindsets i was watching a youtube clip from the bbc clips channel uh, why you shouldn't surrender games and curtis talks about players building bad habits on their main champs while playing normals i've been trying to climb out of silver with melee champs kind of one trick in yone at the moment and i want to keep learning the game as much as possible when I'm feeling feeling like I don't have much intensity, I queue up for normals and focus on learning the matchup or other learning objectives while playing with lower than 100% intensity. Sometimes I'll even play when I'm tired because I feel like I can still learn something from every game or make some use out of it. I notice, however, that I will forget some basics about the game like Dido or Gank because I didn't have enough energy to think about uh, getting lane pro to place good vision, etc. Am I sabotaging myself as a player playing normals with this ranked mindset? Uh, yeah. You are. You are, yeah. definitely. Going back to, remember what we talked about uh, in the first section about Bo playing thousands of games just in top 10 mm. Korean mm. solo queue and, you know, our, and super server solo queue. Mm. So the same thing applies even in gold. If you're, if there's a, when you're, when you're playing silver gold, it doesn't matter what ELO, it doesn't matter. There's a certain style game pace feel level of play. You need to just be in that and that's it. You don't want to divert. If you divert from it, your brain's going to get really weird and you're going to have a different feel for the game. You know, I always say, you know, you think you've laughed at me for this before saying like when I get onto the rift, Sumner's rift, it's like I'm stepping into, it's like my office. It's like my, <laughs> yeah. it's like my, my training room environment. If I play normals, that's not, it's such a, it's a disrespect to my skill level of the game. Like I can't, I can't have fun or, or I mean, he's, I mean, he's not even saying playing fun. He's trying to approach yeah. normals with a ranked mindset. So that's a different conversation, right? Yeah. Um, but that's a separate tangent thing. Like if I was going to play league learning with friends or something, I'll play ARAMs or something completely different, mm. right? So um, yeah, you are absolutely doing damage. I, if you're, if you're want to improve at the game, do not play normals. The moment you go down the normals rabble, you're, you get so much worse at the game. All right, let's, uh, let's use an analogy. Let's use an okay. analogy. Yeah. I let let's say we're playing soccer, okay, and we, we say we play local soccer for our you know t- team and and we want to we, we're trying to improve, but maybe we don't have much energy and we want to do we wanna, still want to play soccer. The analogy would be we're we're going in to play soccer, but we're playing with a different ball. We're literally playing with a ball that's like miniature or something, mm. or like a different shaped ball and it mm. moves differently. Mm. Do you think that's really going to help? Because it's so different. 
you're actually training in a different environment in a way. You're and you're actually creating game. bad... It's actually ruining your muscle memory. Mm. Because tying it back to league, if you're playing Yona in a, in a random normal game, you might be hitting EQ3s that you should never really be hitting. So then you go into your rank game again a day later. And like, I was hitting these. At least this is, again, this is all in, again, your muscle memory. This is what your muscle memory... This is not a conversation with yourself. This is actually happening here in your muscle memory, in your subconscious. Your muscle memory remembers stuff. Right, And so it adapts to the environment. You're only as good as your opponent. So the problem with normal games is that it gets you acclimated to situations that aren't realistic and it gets you acclimated to players playing at a lower level with lower intensity. And you, you put yourself in situations that aren't really going to be the case either. So it's a really easy way also to prop up your confidence to an, like, to, to like overly, to an overly high amount. And it's an easy way to kind of get a mess with your muscle memory. Mm. So if you feel as though you're very, so in my opinion, I, I just want to keep it very simple. If if you have energy, then play. If you don't have energy, then don't, don't play. play. That's simple. Attitude. Don't do the in between, mm. in my opinion. Mm. It's one or the other. Mm. Now, if you are that sort of player that just really struggles to get games in and, and you're, you need, get, you're in silver, you need to get real, real games in, then get those games in on your main. Make it work. Play with 80% intensity on your main. That's completely fine. Just get them in. Get get them under your belt. You don't need to play every single game with 100%, 100% intensity, especially when you're in silver. You need to get start developing that muscle memory and get those games in with as high intensity as you could possibly muster. That's my advice. I'm going to use another example here. You know what would actually be better? So you're going to think about think about our journeys, right? Right. Mm. Um, let's say initially, you know, you play with bots. You were probably mm. trying really hard in those yeah. and stuff, right? But you, ne- you, ne- you, I think you play one ranked. No, game. I tr- no, when I played normals, I was a try hard. You were trying that, so that's the thing. What you wanted want to do, yeah. you can't, you can't you skip. You can't, I didn't play casually like that. Yeah, but like that's what I'm saying. So if you, let's say, if you never play ranked, right, and you use all the BBC mentor mm. stuff, and you only like you're new to the game, you've never touched ranked, and you do it in normals, and you get to a really high level in normals. Then that's that's actually that's good. That's, that's fine. fine. Yeah, yeah. Because you're not going backwards, mm. right? And then you go and ranked, and then the normals is done. There was no such thing as intensity for me as well because I was so excited to play. Yeah. Like I was so ready. Yeah. Like I always wanted to win. This is I, I swear on my life, this is true. Mm. Every single bot game that I played, when I figured out the trick, I would do this every time. What you could do is if you ran um straight, I say, say I'm on blue side and you run straight to their blue. What you could actually do is that the minion, the, the the champions, the bots would come out late. So you could pull the bot, you could bait the bot to run into the blue buff and get first blood every game, no matter what. So I would get a double kill or one kill every game before the minion spawned. Yeah. That's still a thing. Is that still a thing? Yeah, and I would do that every game. Because like I'm so try hard. I would even hard. tell people, come kill me and like, get free kills. Like I would literally like- You're like a strategy. I'm getting, I'm trying. That's how hard I was trying in my bot games. Yeah. I was trying to get as fed as possible. <laughs> like it wasn't acceptable to me. Like it was like- You just trying to perfect it. I was try- yeah, I was trying to perfect. perfect I was trying to like, just dominate. Get. Like just get killed. I get like 20 and 0 type thing. Like I played to win. Mm. Like mm. that's how I- Because I was a noob. Mm. Like, and I wanted to get be- get good. <laughs> How, but how interesting is that? I'm not playing to. Ca- I'm not. There's no casual. Nothing because, casual about because it. Because if you were playing normals and then you would just disrespect bots because you never played normals, so you didn't have yeah, that's that right. Or the build. And when I came into normals, I was really try hard. Yeah, like like and I was, it was like every game was like ranked. It was like ranked to me. Yeah, because yeah, because you knew no better and you had never experienced that's, that. That's right. I was nervous. So this this is the rule of thumb. You if you're a new player listening to this podcast. You're going to high intensity bots, <laughs> you're going to high intensity normals, and then you're going to high intensity. Yeah, ranks. that's the way you you're not going to go bots into normals, back to bots, oh, back no. to normals, and then ranked, and then back to that's that's not no. going to work. Once you touch ranked, you should actually never touch normals again, in my yeah, opinion. That's right. Really? The only, if you really want to play normals, it should be playing something completely different. Like a different role, even different role, not even different chance. Yeah, it has different to be different role. role. Yeah, different role. Like play. If you play mid, play top. Play Eddie yeah. Carry. Yeah, yeah. It's, so play it's, it's fine. Different. If if you play ranked and you play one role and you want to learn top lane, play and you're very relatively new to the game, playing normals is fine. Yeah, that's right. Different, completely different. But it, like what I'm saying to rephrase that, if you want to improve, you're never going to go back to normals to improve on your champion on your right. role. You're only going to use ranked. Yeah. And normal should only be for fun where you're playing other roles completely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next question here is playing from behind follow up uh, plus not liking carrying. 
All right, this is from Fort. He's come in. He's uh, we've answered some of his questions on the BBC before. Hi, Curtis and Nathan. Thanks so much for your response about playing from behind. Since then, I've made a point of having a permanent learning objective of losing with grace. Losing gracefully is one of your big mantras, Curtis. That kicks in whenever I feel like my current learning objectives no longer apply. Apply. I've taken to VOD reviewing my decisions to see how I could have done things to draw more jungle attention or waste more of the enemy's time or otherwise be a nuance, I'm sorry, a nuisance to the enemy team. The idea of losing with grace being a skill that can and needs to be worked on has really helped me stay focused on the game, even when it feels like it's the enemy's game to throw. So that's awesome. That's really important that he's identified lo- no one learning how to lose gracefully in a game is a skill you learn a lot of people you know give up or like they're not the carry they just get really angry that's you know that's they don't respect in that skill and they just give up um on a somewhat parallel note i've had a problem where i don't like being the solo carry of a game i play top lane mostly scion and garen and occasionally not super often but multiple times a week i find myself in a situation where i'm the only person on my team that's ahead but i'm super far ahead and i think the game is winnable if i play out of my mind However, I always feel exhausted and not particularly satisfied when I win such a game. There's always that nagging feeling in the back of my head that is dissatisfied about my teammates not contributing. My favorite games are where uh, one to two of my teammates are strong against two, three fed enemy players. It feels like I mattered. Uh, my, my teammates were also relevant. I don't know what the mental block is that stops me from having fun when I solo carry a game, but I just got out of such a game that I won and I was hoping you guys could shed some light on for this for me. It seems like he, again, he, everyone enjoys the game in different capacities, right? Some people like to play supportive styles and be a complimentary, um, you know, supportive character, right? Like the supports and stuff like that and play tanks top. I used to love doing that as well. I used to love playing Maokai and so facilitating my fed uh, bot lane. I used to love it. It's fun. Mm. So I think own it, you know, it, it, that's why you're playing that role. That's why you're playing those champions. You're playing Garen. You're playing, you know, I'm assuming Scion. Orn. Scion. Yeah, play champs like Orn. Play those champions that can facilitate. Now, yes, there may be those niche situations where you got to step up and do more than your you're probably wanting to or the more that you signed up for, but that's just part of league, right? I think that you just got to adapt with it, suck it up. It's not going to happen all the time. No. The, the, the amount of games where you're the only fed member and everyone else is losing is not that, I mean, that's not that likely unless you're the one contributing to that, that situation, right? So um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. You, that's that's one of the, that's part of the solo queue contract. You are going to have to do that. Um, and I'm assuming that has something to do with your personality, right? Um Again, I'm not a therapist. I'm also, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why that's the case. I'm sure there's some. If you did some digging there, there'd be there'd be some stuff there under the under the surface. But um, I don't think it's unavoidable. You just got to do it. Good. Yeah. If, if you have a really bad feeling with it, do the thank you. Uh, this is a game that I, you know, I, I'm ahead and I'm the one that carry. I didn't have anyone. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Always bring it back to just yeah. Do do what do your job. Do what you can, and um, if you have to carry carry a load bigger than you expected, then you got to do what you got to do. That's it. There's not really much to say about it. It's one of those things you could cop it on the chin or just accept the loss. Either or. What's more painful for you, having to go through that process of trying to carry or accept the loss? That's ultimately a question that you got to answer for yourself. But everyone has their own personality types, and they want to win the game a different way. That's completely fine. And if you're really that fussed about it. I'm sure you can still have that feeling with other champs. Like if you were to a fed Scion or a fed Orn, you know, you're still, you can't genuinely 1v9. You're still facilitating in some way, shape or form, right? You're probably still tanking a lot of damage and then allowing your team to do damage. You can't kill Eng- everyone. Engage in and hoping your team follows like, up. I think he's game. probably, you're also probably only seeing the, mo- the things that you are doing if, in terms of just raw damage. You're probably also not seeing the amount of space that you're creating for the team or how much disruption you're causing in the fight. Like, or your Garen spinning on the back line where you're still wasting three members time and your team is that you're buying your team time to do stuff. Yeah, they might be the most impactful carries, but you're still doing stuff. Depends on how you want to look at it. That's another way. All right, next question here is from Alex. The title of this email is LPL Coaching Culture. Hey, Curtis and Nathan, I recently watched the LPL documentary of EDG, uh, make slash break episode one. 
uh, EDG 2021 LPL documentary. And I found it extremely interesting. One of the main takeaways I found from the documentary was the difference between Western coaching culture compared to the LPL coaching culture. One instance of this in the video was when Flandre mental boomed and quit the scrims and EDG team supervisor Ken Zhu stepped outside to talk to him and gave him a verbal beatdown. Then the next day in the practice room, he blasted Flandry for about 20 minutes in front of everybody. After that, Flandry uh, never walked away from scrims again. I may be wrong, but because of the culture differences, I feel like if the same thing happened in the LCS, the su supervisor would be fired for toxicity or flaming. And the Western players would also be less receptive to harsh criticism and more prickly to defend their ego. Is the coaching culture in the LPL more effective than the coaching culture in Western leagues? I think this is less of a question about what's more effective and I think what's more appropriate in a given culture. Yeah. Chinese culture is different in many Asian, the, you know, the East in general is just very different to the West in terms of just cultural differences. Um, in Korea has talked a lot about in terms of the coaching, the, 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 um, the narrative is that they really respect older people just in general like that's just ingrained there's like a hierarchy yeah, yeah. And they're respecting their, they respect their elders the mm. age is something that's very important in their culture um and that's not just present in sport but it's present in and the hierarchies are just a very important thing in in, in china and south korea and stuff like that mm. we see that it's the same thing in their uh in their work environments like it's a everything's like that that strict you can't corporate. leave until your boss leaves and stuff like that right stuff like that and then it is present in the west as well to certain degrees but it's just heightened in the east so i think that it's very difficult to say which one is the more quote unquote most effective because what's most effective is what works with that group of people that's right right that could be what that kenzo did in with that team with flandre there's an argument to be made that that maybe is the best way to go about well, it. Well, you know, I mean, we don't know his relationship really. I mean, you never going to go in. We don't really know, right? You know, with but in China, player. you know, with that team, given their all their past experiences and the way they're brought up, they're probably used to that. They're probably used to getting scolded by their teachers and their managers and all this and that, being told what to do. And if you don't do it, then you're kicked. Type thing. It's like it's a brit. By the way, China, it's very brutal. No, like you can, you're easily replaceable. That's very, thing. very easy replaceable. The, the difference in NALCS is that like, you're not easily replaceable. <laughs> so the, the power is in the players, as we like to say. In, in, the, in the West, the players have the power. In the East, the coaching staff has the power. Most of the time, not all the time, most of the time because of the large talent pool. And obviously there's exceptions to the rule because there's some certain highlight player, amazing players that you never want to get, never want to replace. But- Across the board, that is the, the case and what we found. But yeah, so I would say rather than framing it in what's better, I would say this is, again, just more cultural differences and what works with your group of people. I'm sure that that way is probably a lot more efficient though, right? Um, but we don't know what the long-term consequences of that is. It might be really efficient in that moment. Let's say you get immediate results. Maybe Flandre is able to perform now for the rest of that split, but we don't know what's going to happen with that relationship down the line is mm. it going to deteriorate is he mm. going to get worn down is he going to mm. get just beat down by that coach over time to the point where he doesn't perform next year we've seen that too where people get rode way too hard they lose confidence i've even done that myself to players where i've read, written a player way too hard that's right and, and then they lose confidence and that, that you maybe get a little bit of energy out of them for a short period of time but then they're done mm. you've ruined them mm. players ruin play coaches ruin players all the time that's right doing that exact thing mm. So um, it's a very delicate situation. Delicate. I mean, there's many examples of like, you see in NFL, you know, like the players, coaches and like different yeah. cultures. Of, you know, you talk about the Pete Carroll and like doctor in the Seattle Seahawks. Like, yeah. you know, there's just different styles and different you know, cultures Wooden, like, and vibes. Yeah. John you know, Wooden is a very different. Bill for Walsh minutes. was a real like meme. It was like, he's a del like, he was like taking control of everything. Bill Walsh from the 40, uh, the 49ers. And then yeah, Pete Carroll, very, very different. Um, John Wooden, very, very different. Even the Sean Sean McVay mm. from the Rams, Rams, very different. All the coaching in in, in the NFL, what we've what we've noticed is extremely different. Um, and again, it really depends on the culture that you want to really create in your organization and what's accepted, because you also scout for that ideally in your recruitment. What like, you're looking for to fit into your team, right? You're not just gonna you, in in traditional sport. They have more. I guess leeway because again they have so many these sports are so popular they have so the talent pools are huge so you can probably pick and choose the sort of players that fit your culture 
Whereas in esports, sometimes, especially at the highest level, are you really going to give a shit if Bo fits in your team culture? Probably you just not. Plug and play. You're <laughs> you so plug good. and play. Yeah. <laughs> Plug and play. At least that's the way league is right now. It's like when you get, uh, <laughs> you know, when you like buy a TV or you buy something, it's just like this instruction, just plug and play. It's like, that's yeah. like an advertising thing, you know, yeah. it's super easy. Good yep. to go. That's right. Well, it's like, it's like, it could be really environmental friendly, but it looks darn good. You yeah. know, <laughs> is that something that's important to you? Mm. For some people it is, for some people it's not. All right. We'll wrap up the podcast there. Good work, everyone. Let's keep on improving in solo queue. The end of the season is fast approaching. We'll see you next time.